maybe what I will do, just to give you the trajectory of the extended assistance and its impact in Africa, because that's very important for us to look at that one and maybe zoom in a bit of looking at the uh, some of the things that the lessons we can learn from there. But then the, the, the real question is the leveraging and the core external partners. I would like to take U.S. and China as a key partners, having the battlefield, actually, Africa, and specifically South Sudan. So I will look at that one from, from the perspective of somebody who saw these, uh, these donors in action in South Sudan. And then some of the challenges in managing the external assistance. And then I will um, conclude with the case of South Sudan briefly. I know some of you may know a lot about South Sudan. And possibly with some key takeaway I believe to share with you. I think generally, if you look at the, 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 the train of assistance to, to Africa, you could clearly see immediately after the, uh, after the Cold War, it started declining. The trend seemed to be declining. But considerably, I think Africa is still having a very substantial uh, assistance coming from, I mean, in relation to other subregions. And this is a very positive. But still, we may need to look at it in the terms of the quality of assistance, because I will come later on whose agenda and whether this is enhancing the national ownership and the, uh, and the national ownership of the, uh, of, the, of the recipient countries. But as you can see also, if you look down, maybe some of these figures are not that, especially when you look to the U.S., you could clearly see how the uh, U.S. interest, like any other donors, is, is shaping the way assistance is being delivered to the, to the uh, after the 9-11, you could see clearly the jump of the, the, uh, the security system in relation to the, uh, the development system. And, and these are things that we may need to look at the who's agenda, because I think it's very important to, to look at this trend, which I think is, is a positive in a way, but you could see clearly how assistance itself coming to Africa is shared by the donor's interest. Did it pay off, this assistance? I think if you look at this figure about the, what happened, I think the good news is that the, uh, the, uh, I, I could divide Africa into two phases of liberation. Before, during the year, uh, the colonial, what is called, somebody said about, the first liberation was liberation from the colonial, colonial powers. And you could see before the, in the 60s, and what happened, people said actually the first colonial elites of Africa were even worse than the colonial power. And this is what I say, they, you need to have another liberation, the liberation from the liberators. And we are seeing this pattern in all over Africa. You could see clearly the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coup d'etat was so quite uh, rampant, and then the autocracy was actually quite clear. And then the, uh, the uh, but then afterwards, especially after the Cold War, you, you are seeing a very positive trend of, uh, of democracy gaining momentum and, 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 and autocracy actually dwindling in, 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 in Africa, which is a very, a very positive in a sense. And actually there's a book, uh, Making Africa Work. It's a book which is a very interesting to look at to what level assistance or the development itself, I mean democracy itself can enhance development. It has never been proven but I think some studies started showing now it is paying off that democracies, they tend to perform better in terms of the economic growth. But I think that is a good side of it. But then when you look also at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the, this assistance in relation to the fragility and the establishment of the capacity of a state, then you could see clearly Africa is having the highest number of the fragile countries. But this map, I mean, this, uh, this graph is showing us, in actual fact, the, 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 uh, the fragile resource poor, they tend to perform even less, I mean, uh, less than, the, uh, than the, uh, the, resilient, the resilient countries. But when I talk about resilient, the countries that are having resilient institutions, institutions that can actually be sustaining any shocks and over time. So you, I could say also this, there's a, a high level of fragility in Africa. But even the, uh, to put it in perspective, I think IMF did some work 
recently to see to what level these countries are actually exiting from the fragility over time. Out of 102 countries, they found about, about, about half of these countries, they, they have a very weak capacity, what is called the capacity trap. I will, uh, but out of these even, most of them, they have a negative growth, economic growth. Uh, but only about 8% are having strong capabilities, I mean capacity of the state. And they try to project what, what it will take for this country to exit from these weak institutions to a more resilient and, uh, and a strong institution. And for the middle, the middle, um, the middle capacity state, it will take them, eight of them out of these 31, before the end of century and four will take more than 50 years. But worse than this, in fact, if you look at the weak institution, weak uh, uh, state, it will take them forever for them to exit from this capacity trap. It's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite disappointing. Even for Africa, about 26 fragile states, 12 of them, will take them until 2039. Very depressing, but there are a lot of good news there. But I just want to give you, despite the fact you have a very good picture about the about, about what is happening in, in terms of assistance and, and African rising, still you have all these challenges. Now, so let me take now these two countries, US, China, as an example of what the, uh, the, the resistance. I think we should accept that the US, there's a very clear trend of militarization of US foreign policy towards Africa, especially after the post 9-11. But I want also to echo a very important issues, the pillars of US foreign policy. These pillars for me are quite inspirational to most, to the world, but especially, especially to Africa. When you talk about the promotion of human rights, democracy, international justice, rule of law, free trade. And, the, and, the, and then, then the graph that I showed was a clear example. This one is paying off these, these global values. But then we should recognize also there has been a clear shift in U.S. engagement in Africa according to its, its, its strategic interests. And that's the fact. And to, just to, 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 to highlight the point, the Cold War period was a clear case whereby you have the, uh, the militarization and anti-communist period. Then came the post-Cold War where Africa started gaining a prominence in the U.S. foreign policy. And then the post 9-11 shifted the whole focus now again to the, uh, to the militarization and focus on the uh, counter-terrorism. I was in South Africa. There's a big debate in Africa whether the Western countries, the Western civilization is retreating from its global values. And that debate is very important because Africa, they're seeing the way they look up it to, to the US. To, to Europe, a lot, of, a lot of question marks are coming out. And, and I think that the challenge is actually African to know these global values are not for the US or not for the, it is actually inbuilt in their own system, in their own traditions. Even if, I, <laughs> if the West retreated from these global values, Africa should take the challenge in actually championing these values for them. But I want just to, 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 to highlight this point of a feeling of retreat from these global values by the, uh, by the Western countries. Let me move to China. China is creeping in very rapidly to, to Africa. Just to give you that map itself is showing how China is becoming dominant except to the Western side of, of, of the continent. And if you see for the first time the deployment of the US keeping forces is increasing very rapidly. And actually started no other place like infantry. A battalion started actually happening in, in, in South Sudan. Clear case of their economic interests driven them to focus on security interests. And it's a big, it's a big, it's a big thing. The, uh, the, the Chinese encroaching into, the, uh, into, into Africa. Now, and linked to this one, it is what I say, the feeling of Africans of the three from these global values. And China will get is definitely a good ground here for it to, to, to assert its, its, its leadership in, in, in Africa. 
just to give you some of the some of the uh, some of the things happening for the first time, China in 1992 voted for the first time for chapter seven in peacekeeping, and then the first deployment of the infantry pl uh, um, platoon was in 2012 in South Sudan, and then the first deployment of infantry company in Mali in two, 2013. And in 2015, that's the first deployment of infantry battalion in South Sudan. And China came to a conclusion it cannot pursue its economic interests without focusing on security. And you could see clearly how China is started now in terms of the funding of UN peacekeeping forces uh, in, 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 in generally is increasing, becoming now the second to the US. So it's a, it's a real, it's a real. It's something I want you to be, to be aware about. So, so these are the two countries I want you to see how Africa will navigate and put itself in these, between these two giants. That may, in the, the, in the future, it may shape which way Africa will be going. Now, but I want to, to say in terms of the challenges, the thing that we can learn from the development to the security. And my own experience in South Sudan and in Sudan, these are some of the, my take about what are the things we can learn from the development assistant to the security assistant. One, Africans, they have come to a conclusion. Some researchers found that they, uh, what is called, there, there is a very clear poverty of development strategies in Africa. And they have looked at the history of development assistance uh, and development strategies in Africa. This lack of coherent development policies seem to be one of the things explaining why the rising Africa may not explain so much the benefit to the citizen of Africa. And this one, I compare it to what I call also the poverty of security strategies. In, 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 because in most cases, we don't have security strategies in most of the African countries. Out of 54, only six of these African countries have national security strategies that at least that are published are available on the on the year. And then this idea, this, this, this challenge of lack of capacity for the strategic thinking uh, to consolidate the gains that Africa can, can see. Uh, I'm seeing the same, I will come later on about the, is, is even in the security sector, it's Africa tend to become recipient to some of these things and rather than thinking critically to itself. One of the, one of the things that dominated the, the development assistant is these economic advisors to the, uh, to the governments this, as part of the technical assistant. And these advisors are becoming more like a policy makers, especially in the development side. We are seeing the same trend, security advisor becoming policy makers in the security uh, sector. In the development, they focus so much on this poverty reduction becoming like supplanting the national policies. And this is the clear case of the prescription of the World Bank, IMF, of how they look to Africa. It is exactly in the security sector, the security sector reforms are becoming like, these are a substitute to the national security strategy. And the, and the other one, this is the whole lot of free trade, this is actually, we are seeing even the rising Africa, what is happening, Africa is rising because of the primary commodities. It's not because of innovation, it is not because of industrialization. It is exactly what is happening in the security sector. Because of the trade, you need not to make innovation in the industry, in the research, in the security sector. You can get it outside there. And the last one, looking to Africa as a country. And that is a big thing, how much we talk today. Still, Africa is a country. In fact, it's not a country. It's so simple. But the moment we get into the real practice, we, we tend to look to Africa as, as, a, as, a, as a country. Now, let me come now to South Sudan. South Sudan, I was engaged about this leveraging the external assistance. I was engaged with the World Bank at the early stage. The post, in, uh, the post peace agreement, uh, uh, negotiating the peace agreement. But then after that, we, we entered into what is called the joint assessment mission. 
And that you're in an assessment mission because you have the warring parties, the Sudan government and the SPLM, the, the rebels, were not having a very coherent policies. So the idea was to bring them together with the UN, United Nations, and other key players to assess the needs, the post-conflict needs. And that resulted in having joint assessment um, uh, report. That becoming like a blueprint of how we should be able to engage immediately after the, uh, after the, uh, after the peace agreement. And one of them is developing what is called multi-donor trust fund. <coughs> By then, I was at the early stage of, of managing this fund, especially with the, uh, with, the, with the World Bank. And there I could see clearly Southern Sudan receiving a huge amount of resources from its own oil and with a very high commitment of international community. I have never seen such a country loved by international community in the region, in the continent. And then you have all these resources coming in at the same time. And the capacity, I remember when I, when I, ent when I went to Juba for the first time after the peace agreement, just seeing the civil servant, they're still using the old typewriters. Huh? And actually, they, and here you have millions of resources coming to these people. And we in the World Bank were having a very restricted <coughs> process of procurement and how to approve the, and you get a, a secretary, um, the, the civil servant, the undersecretary dealing with companies with millions of contracts. His salary is just only about 500 and no capacity. A clear case of how humanitarian assistance coming to supplant the, 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 uh, the, the capacity. And it was by necessity, nothing was there. So you get these advisors. When I become a minister, I think I spend most of my time about not less than 70% of my time just having meetings with the donors coming and now and coordinating them was such a very difficult, difficult thing. But anyhow, this map is showing you in the multi-donor trust fund, it was a commitment if, 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 if South Sudan, I mean, the donors can contribute $1 and then Sudan, South Sudan will contribute $2 for this pool of multi-donor trust fund so that you can be using this one in order to, to go for the development. It took almost two or three years just to spend the amount being allocated to the multi donor trust fund. Simply because there was lack of capacity. A clear case. And, and, the, and the idea, you know, the, the, the donors is that you want to spend more now and then it's scaling down. Rather than it's standing, it's, it, it, it have a regressional uh, spending of the, uh, of the assistance. That one, one of the things actually I could see happen in South Sudan. But the good thing, even South Sudan managed to develop what is called aid strategy. The biggest problem is not donors coordinating among themselves, but even coordinating with the government. The good thing about South Sudan, there was what is called the donors coordination um, uh, group. I think the European, they managed to set up an office, I think, for the first time, which was very good. Although the U.S. was not in that, U.S. ID was not part of the EU. But then this aid strategy was a very clear case, very strategic of how to ensure the national ownership. And, 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 and I will give you some of the, and the donors were actually working together with, in, the, in the budget processing, even the implementation and sharing the information. Now, an evaluation was done. Uh, yes, I want to give you some of this one, I guess, to, see, to, to, to tell you how the shifting of the, uh, of the assistant over time, especially for the EU. But this is, this is what happened about the, about the this coordination of assistance. To what level they have managed to enhance national ownership. A very clear three, I mean about certain parameters for this aid coordination. Alignment, improving coordination, harmonization, predictability, and mutual accountability. And the last one, institutional development. These were the Clear case, I mean, the, 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 the aid strategy. So what happened? In the alignment, it was agreed with the donors that the aid should be aligned with the government six development priorities. And these priorities were put, especially in the joint assessment mission, was security, rule of law, education, health, water, and food security. In actual practice, government was having limited influence 
over the allocation decision made in donors' capitals. And they work directly with the, with the NGOs. Coordination. To a certain degree, coordination succeeded. Harmonization. The idea was the donors' projects and program to be harmonized. The evaluation showed that there was a widespread project proliferation and, and fragmentation. Then predictability. And this is one of the things for, for, for NAA to be predictable. And, and, and it was clear that the donors provide their spending forecast every, over a multi-period, uh, multi-year period. Most cases, donors, they continue to plan in annual cycle. Mutual accountability, it was a clear case. The government was sharing, but the donors were not actually sharing. The accountability was just only one-sided. In institutional development, there was no inbuilt exit strategy and to enhance the capacity of the, of the, uh, of the institution of the state. So this is the experience of South Sudan. So what was the results? This is a country now is in war, is having the, the largest population of refugees on the continent. The, the, the famine, this famine now, and you have the massive abuses of, 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 of power. And here is a challenge even for the US invested heavily in this, in, in, in this country. And it's a dilemma whether you should be watching a country that exonerated, I mean, relinquished its, 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 its commitment as a state, a functioning state, and let down its citizen. I have never seen such a country with such abuses. And, and, uh, and yet, people are watching it. And, uh, now, let me conclude with the following. I want to conclude with these few things. Uh, there's a World Development Report 2011. And this is a very important report for me. What is good with this report is just putting how, how countries in fragility and in violence, they can exit to achieve uh, citizen security, citizen justice, and citizen uh, and, and jobs. And the cycle is very important. Two elements are very important. One is the transformation of the institutions. The second one is the restoration of confidence. And in actual fact, sometimes it is very important to focus on this, this issue of social cohesion as a prerequisite when you talk about the institutions. And we have seen, in actual, this report is saying, the social fabric, and, and this is what is happening even when, when in South Sudan, we focus that they have the independence. We assume that they're actually united. The social capital is quiet. That is not. And you start jumping immediately for the, for the formation and the restoration of the year, of, of transform, I mean the, uh, the institutions. Sometimes these institutions are built at a very big high level, but don't actually not touch the ground. It was about Cuba. And that's what happened when this crisis happened in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the ruling party. And this is one thing. When I talk about social cohesion, you're talking about all actors, including the political parties. And the politics of political parties have a very compelling uh, implication to the stability of the state. So uh, this issue of in, uh, social cohesion is very important. And it has been found. Even if you may have shocks, the only thing we can hedge and protect this institution, it is this social cohesion. And it's something that I want to, 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 to highlight. The, the second one is the whole lot of national vision and national ownership. Sometimes we talk about it. There are some countries in Africa that have succeeded by having a very well-articulated, people-centered uh, vision. And, and, and for example, Rwanda is a good example. It is when you have this national vision that is owned by the people. Sometimes these are the things that we may need to focus in our assistance. The second one, national security strategy is quite important for the coordination of any assistance. In fact, what Africa needs is not about more assistance. It is how to manage best its resources. Let me give to conclude with this one. 
This one is a very recent information about the, how much is getting into Africa and how much is getting out of Africa. But 41 billion extracted each year from Africa. That one is equivalent to the amount of assistance Africa is receiving. And imagine if we focus on melding the resources of African countries, especially in the security sector, we could easily save 41 billion. Thank you very much.